deeply entrenched within the militia of the Soul Society for almost her entire life, to the point where it is the only life she has ever truly known. The captain of the second division and corps commander of the Omnitz Kiddo, Soifon, is reflective of many of Bleach's best traits when it comes to writing female characters. First off, she's unashamedly a total badass. She's powerful, prideful, fierce, doesn't take any rubbish from her colleagues or subordinates, and at the same time combines that with a fantastic, sleek design that successfully distills down her one central core theme into something truly brilliant. And pairs that with a Zanpakuto and power set that is ultimately very creative and truly unique. But Soifon is not perfect, and Kubo creates a wonderfully flawed and complex character with numerous layers. First of all, Soifon is obviously one of the youngest and most inexperienced of the contemporary Gote 13 captains. Despite having been brought up in that harsh, assassin-led environment, Soifon is at the end of the day still very young, and that shines through in some of her personality flaws. She's extremely brash, sometimes reckless, and very quick to anger, even showing signs of insubordination, which is truly fascinating for a character who values law and order above almost anything else. And so, in that sense, we get a character of almost two halves. I believe that she staunchly believes in her own ideals, the mantra of the Omnitz kiddo and the family that she was born into. When she says that anybody who gets in her way is her enemy and she won't hesitate to cut them down, or when she tells Omida that the single key most important principle of being a member of the Omnitz kiddo is to let your let your ally die if it means you can score a valuable hit on the enemy. I think she truly believes all of that, and she believes in sharing those hard-earned lessons with her subordinates as well. But on the other side, I think there's a character who is surprisingly delicate on the inside, someone who doesn't just want this to be her life, and we see that in her in the culmination of her confrontation with Yoruichi when she breaks down. It doesn't mean she's weak in any way, but it reveals a slightly more delicate side to this character that has been bottled up for so very long as she has effectively presented this mask, this facade, to the outside world ever since she lost the one person that she has truly come to care about. And so I've always found that to be a very interesting internal conflict, internal dichotomy with this character. And so, as promised, we're looking at the runner-up of our last character analysis poll in this video, Soifon, which I'm really excited to dive into the weeds with. Before we get started on the video, guys, thank you so much for getting us to 150,000 subscribers. I can't thank you enough, but I really do appreciate it. And if you are new here, make sure to hit subscribe for more Bleach content like this every single week. Give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I really would appreciate it, and it would really support the channel as well. And if you want to take that support from me another step further, we do have a Patreon for the channel too, where you can get videos like this one early, and you can support me for as little as a dollar a month. Thank you again, as always, to everyone who is supporting me over there on Patreon. I really do appreciate it. And of course, before we begin, as with all of my character analysis videos, this one will have spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach. So Soifon was born into the lower noble Fon family, which is a family that has always been intertwined and an integral part of the Omnitz kiddo. All they have ever known is effectively being the the weapon of the Soul Society, of the core commander of the Omnitz Kiddo. They have always been brought up to serve, in this instance, at this point in time in history, Yoroichi Shihoin, who to Soifon is like this blazing, radiant god. That's basically how Soifon has always been brought up to see her. And so, I think that's always been really fascinating to me, the, the class divide that's apparent even between a one of the highest, one of the five most high-ranking noble families, and one of the lower-ranking noble families. It's not like Soifon is some Rukongai Ru peasant. She is still in a, in a lower noble family, but her whole life is laid out before her, before she even gets a chance to make any of her own decisions. She must serve and protect 
Yodoichi Shihoi. And I've always found that to be really kind of cool about Soifon. She was brought up in one of the most harsh environments in the Soul Society, outside of being in, in the furthest districts of the Rukongai. But here she was brought up for one clear purpose. And you know, if you don't if you don't match up, if you aren't good enough, it results in death. Soifon is the only survivor. She has five other siblings, all of whom are dead, because they, they couldn't match up. And Soifon so then ends up seeing the world, I think, through a very black and white lens. And that explains, I think, why Yoruichi is so valuable to Soifon. And I want to get into that. We may as well start with that because I think Yoruichi and Soifon's relationship is definitely one of the most interesting aspects of this character. But I think one of the reasons Soifon gra gravitated so greatly to Yoruichi to the point of almost worshipping her was because she provided Soifon with an out from the black and white world that she's been presented ever since she was born. Now, of course, Soifon believes that it is her duty in life to protect, to defend, to serve Yoroichi no matter what as a member of the Omnitz Kiddo. But Yoroichi's demeanour, her laissez-faire attitude to life essentially, has always kind of thrown Soifon for a loop and I think kind of presented her with the notion that it doesn't have to just be about duty. There is more to life than just duty. And Yoroichi, and that's what's so surprising to Soifon, is that so Yoroichi is supposed to be Soifon's target. And yet, she of all people is the one breaking those conventions, telling Soifon, lighten up, you know, have a bit of fun, we can learn things together, we can grow together. And so, in both a literal and figurative sense, Yoroichi is the sun breaking through Soifon's pretty bleak world. Literal in the sense that Soifon has always had to see and worship Yoroichi as this wondrous, gleaming princess. And I love the imagery Kubo uses of, of Yoroichi walking across that very high bridge to show there will always be that difference between them so long as Soifon believes it to be there. But Yoroichi, despite knowing her station, doesn't care for that difference and closes the gap. Now, Soifon, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the youngest captains of the Gotei 13, and I think also one of the most divisive among fans. A lot of people absolutely love Soifon, and that's absolutely fine, but for me, on a personal level, she's always been a somewhat frustrating character, and a lot of that is down to her personality flaws. But Soifon has always just kind of annoyed me sometimes in canon, in world. For example, when she, you know, she's at death's door in this incredibly desperate battle against Baragon Louisenbahn in the fake Karakura town arc, and yet she still has to make this childish deal with Hachigen Ushoda before she's willing to keep the fight going against an enemy she's otherwise certainly going to lose against. And that sort of thing... While it is a nice extra layer for her character, has always kind of struck me as not being particularly worthy of the rank of captain. And the same, of course, Kubo really plays up the insubordination angle of, of Soifon in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, where everything seems to start to overwhelm her a little bit. And certainly the situation is totally dire in the Thousand Year Blood War. But more than ever, it feels like Soifon is the outlier and the one who's just not prepared for what's going on. You know, she's screaming at, at, uh, at the Raite Tai when he delivers the message about Byakuya and Kenpachi. She really kind of out of order has a go at Kensei, revealing her prejudice towards him and the other Vizards this entire time. She even has a go. She even has the gall to have a go at the Zero Division when they arrive and Tenjiro very quickly puts her in her place. And it's all this sort of thing that I think is really intriguing for her character because it does seem to put her on a pedestal compared to the rest of the captains as being somewhat inexperienced. Now, Soifon sits somewhere in the middle, I would say, in terms of captain exposure. And she has a pretty lengthy manga lifespan stretching from chapter 81, which is where a lot of those initial captains were revealed, right the way through to the Hell chapter at the end of the series. But that's not to say she plays a massive role during all of that 
and but she like I said, she's ranked somewhere in the middle for exposure. She tends to have in the three big arcs at least one fight per arc, being Yodoichi. Then she gets two in the Odan Car arc, Geo Vega and Barragon, and then BG9 in the Thousand Year Blood War. There are plenty of things I absolutely adore about this character, specifically from a visual standpoint. I think Soifon maybe has one of the best designs of all of the captains. How Kubo so incredibly takes this central theme, I would say, of Sting, or of Hornet, or even just of Kill, because basically that's all what Soifon is about from a visual flair standpoint, and just translates it so wonderfully into a character. She's leaf, she's nimble, she's small, she is like a wasp or something like that, with this stinger on her finger with her Shikai Suzumibachi, and I just think it's so, it's so cool how she just perfectly encapsulates everything Kubo wants her to be in her personality in so much as how she looks. But certainly, yeah, her personality does, I guess, rub me the wrong way sometimes, particularly in those desperate situations like against Barragon, where it feels like you should just be fighting anyway, especially for a character who is so duty bound to have her turn her nose up against. I mean, and it makes total sense for her character. You know, she hates the Vizard most likely blaming them and Kisuke for Yoroichi having to abandon the Soul Society, so she, despi she despises them, but you think she would be able to put those differences aside. You know, compare her to another young captain, Hitsugaya, who shares many of the same traits in that they are both quite brash, they are both quite reckless, and Hitsugaya, you know, costs the heroes big time eventually in the fake Karakura town, but... He does not hold the same prejudice that Soifon does. You know, he is willing to set aside their differences and work with Lisa and Hitsugaya to fight Haribel. Whereas with Soifon, it is a real effort to get her to work with Hachi. And Hachi feels like he's exasperated at having to deal with this. And in that kind of situation, I just don't think that's how a captain should be acting. But at the same time, I think it works for her character and makes total sense, so... But to move on and look at her visual design, something I was just gushing about a minute ago, I just do think she looks brilliant. Uh, my favourite look of hers is probably her original look in the Soul Society arc. I think she's got a great hairstyle. I love the massive braids with the big rings coming off. I think that's so cool as well. I love the small differences too, the fact that she has the big obi sash on the outside of her Hayori as, uh, as opposed to underneath as it is traditional to wear it. And again, the fact that she stands out so greatly by being effectively a ninja in a world full of samurai, I think is again really, really just an awesome character design trait. And Suzumibachi as well is a great Zanpak toe. I absolutely love the simplicity of it, the gold and the black, making it look like a hornet or a bee or something like that. It's just so very clever. And Nigeki Kesatsu as well, being this really awesome ability that I just think is a hallmark of Kubo's absolute skill in designing characters. Now, one thing I want to talk about before we move into her role in Bleach is her Bankai, Jakuho Raikoben, which has always been a really contentious topic of discussion. And I, I get it. I do understand why people hate this Bankai, because in many ways it doesn't fit Soifon at all. And it's difficult to see how that really makes sense when a Zanpak Toe and a Bankai is supposed to be a reflection of the Shinigami's very soul. So for it to be totally against the very core of what Soifon is, which is an assassin, is weird. But at the same time, I do, I, I actually kind of like this Bankai, although I do also think it might be one of the most useless in the entire series as well. But her Bankai, Jakuho Raikoben, is effectively an, a colossal missile launcher that is strapped to her entire arm and does exactly what it says on the tin. It fires a missile at its opponent. And it's pretty clear what Kubo is doing with this. It's an evolution of her Shikai, which is two steps to kill. Her Bankai is clearly supposed to be one step to kill. It should be a one-hit kill colossal nuke essentially and I like the spectacle of it but even that you know it implies something has gone wrong here because Soifon is not supposed to be about spectacle she's supposed to be this nimble ghost-like opponent who steps in and kills someone before they can even tell what's happened that's the core of what it means to be an assassin in the world of the Gote 13 and so her Bankai which is 
incredibly flashy, takes seemingly a while to even charge up and fire. As Soifon herself says, the flashy nature of my Barnkai goes totally against what it means to be an assassin. So th that is, and that's why people don't like it, and I totally, I totally get it. You know, you think something like, as we mentioned in our last video, Ginichimaru's Kamishini no Yari might be more suited, particularly the poison aspect, to someone like Soifon. But actually, I do like Jakuho Raiko Ben. A, it's very unique, but B, I think it does technically fit her. Because as we mentioned earlier, there's more to Soifon than just the cold, calculating killer in the shadows. She is brash, she is reckless, and she is quick to anger, and I think that is personified with her Bankai. Whether she likes it or not, those are core components of her personality, and her Bankai, which is quite literally explosive, fits that very, very well. Like I said, in the Thousand Year Blood War, we see a Soifon on numerous occasions who's very quick to anger and suddenly just bark at somebody. And I think that's perfect with a Jakuho Raiko Ben. The main issue I have with Jakuho Raiko Ben is it's an awful lot of investment and it doesn't seem to be a lot of return. You know, Soifon mentions that it, it it drains her to use this Bankai, which makes a lot of sense. That kind of destructive power condensed must be an awful lot of Rayatsu. And there's also the fact that it requires a lot of setup as well. We see in the Iran Karak she must wrap herself to a building with a Jinjo Tan in order to not go absolutely flying when she fires this thing. And again, I like all of that. Really cool kind of lore and world building for this character. Really awesome setup for a Bankai. But for a Bankai that is presumably all about this idea of one step to kill, it's killed absolutely no one so far, which is really weird, um, considering especially as well that she actually hits her enemies basically point blank with it both times. In the battle against Barrigan, Louise and Barn, after Hatchie and Soifon actually do finally team up, they successfully trap the Espada in a small enclosed space, which means his Respirar won't be able to act fast enough to deal with the explosion if it's literally right in his face. And so Soifon does just that. She fires Jakuho Raiko Ben, basically point blank at Barrigan in what is a really cool scene. And while Barrigan is certainly very injured, he survives it. And that, again, feels like a weird invalidation of what her Bankai should be. Now, certainly, like I said, he is very injured. Barragon emerges from the smoke, missing half of his head, one of his arms, and a big chunk of his body as well. And I, I hate to imagine what he would look like if he returned to his base form with half of his face missing. Or maybe Soifon injured him so badly that he can't ever return to his base form. I don't know if that's a thing or not. But it is just weird that he survives that. And I get that it's for, you know, cinematic effect and Kubo wanted Hachi to win that fight, but it is kind of weird. And then later on in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, she blasts Sturmritter K BG-9 with her Bankai as well. And while it's not point blank, BG-9 has been rendered unable to move and so he can't avoid it and it hits him square in the face. Once again, he survives it, albeit he has most of his face missing. But again, he's a robot thing, so it doesn't really matter to him. He's later seen bowing to Yuha Bart with a big chunk of his face and his chest missing, but for all intents and purposes, seems to be absolutely okay. So it's just a bit of a shame that Soifon's Bankai does take such a toll on her, is such a setup to use, and should theoretically, thematically, be a one-hit kill, and yet never manages it. But that's really my only issue with her Bankai, otherwise I think it fits her really well. It's the side of Soifon that she doesn't like to accept is true, but it is, and it's a part of her, this, this brash, hot-headed nature, this explosive temperament, and that's what we get with her Bankai. So, moving on to Soifon's role in the story, and as I mentioned earlier, she has kind of a medium amount of exposure compared to some captains. She's definitely got more exposure than the Vizards, that is for sure, characters like Tosa, and maybe even Komamura as well, though that's pretty arguable, I'd say. And she has nowhere near the exposure of Byakia, Kenpachi, Kyoraku, Hitsugaya. So she does fall kind of in that middle bracket. Soifon has a very, very, very small part to play in Turn Back the Pendulum. Uh, obviously, 110 years prior to the main storyline, she is serving under Yoroichi. But Soifon's role here is very, very small. It's massively fleshed out in the anime itself. But as far as the canon manga goes, she really doesn't do an awful lot in Turn Back the Pendulum whatsoever. It's just nice to see her here. The Soul Society arc is where Soifon really kind of 
begins to to come into her own as a character. You know, she's present at the initial captain's meeting. Then you get your first kind of interaction with her where she speaks to Omida as everyone's preparing to head to the execution of Rukia. And it's here that we learn a lot about Soifon's worldview, her mindset going into the story of Bleach, where she basically says, you know, the laws have been set, Rukia is to be executed, um, and that she will do whatever she has to to ensure that, you know, the law is carried out, that duty is fulfilled. And, you know, she says to Omida, like, if anyone gets in my way, they are my enemy, and that goes for you as well. Basically, Soifon is there to almost, like I said, robotically carry out orders. It's nice characterization because you see right from the off that she couldn't be any different to her vice captain, Omida, who is boorish, picking his nose, eating, eating, just scuffing his face with food, doesn't seem to be particularly dignified whatsoever compared to this very well-kept, very, like I said, well, she's just a ninja at the end of the day. She is the head of the assassin corps of the Soul Society. That weight is on her shoulders, that burden that she has forcibly had to take from Yoroichi. And she feels every ounce of that as well. And Omida is just totally flippant about everything. But she says, you know, she's almost like trying to instill some kind of values into him, but it also feels like she's given up on him as well. And I think that's really well, that's really good characterization from the off. And we see as well that Soifon in the civil war that brews as you would expect, is firmly on the side of the Soul Society, on the side of law and order, regardless of regardless of whether or not she believes it to be right or not, it doesn't matter. All that matters is her orders, is, you know, what she's been told to do. And you can see as well that she looks down on those that she believes are not following the path of Soul Society when she comments on how bad the attendance is at Rukia's execution. It's unfathomable to her that some might disagree with what's going on or some might have ulterior motives. And we see this really well after the Sokyoku is destroyed by Kyoraku and Ukitake. She attacks Kione and Sentaro without hesitation. You know, even with Ukitake right there, Soifon attacks Sentaro, sending him flying, and then stomps on Kione's chest, calling her trash, you know, saying, you know, you're a dog. Soifon feels like the new age face of Soul Society totalitarianism, you know, of this oppressive regime that's willing to batter its own own. Uh, foot soldiers, its own men, its own officers is the word I was looking for, uh, if, if it perceives that they have done something against the party, you know, against the regime. And I think that's really cool, and it makes Soifon an effective antagonist, or villain, I guess, in the Soul Society arc, because she's someone who you, you can't be reasoned with. That's kind of scary, and it is the same with Yamamoto as well. And again, like I said at the start of this video, that comes about due to really how she was raised, but also the ultimate betrayal that she suffered. Were Yoroichi still around? I do not think, crucially, that Soifon would be like this at all. I think she would likely have continued to take many of the traits she was taking from Yoroichi. She would be more open-minded, slightly more chilled out, I guess, would be a, a way of looking at it. But um, I think Yoroichi leaving robbed her of, of all those chances. She was slowly beginning to become more like Yoroichi, and after she left, she reverted back big time. But speaking of Yoroichi, Soifon gets her first major fight of the series as Yoroichi saves Kione's life by attacking Soifon and throwing them both from the Sokyoku Hill. And this fight is a fight that I am really looking forward to one day doing a battle analysis on because I think it's pretty fantastic, if I have to say so myself. I think it's brilliant. Because Bleach is so typically swordplay dominated, it is so awesome to get a proper hand-to-hand -hand fight between two absolute masters. And Kubo makes the most of it as well. The choreography on show here is so awesome. There's one moment that just looks brilliant where they kind of lock arms and legs in midair. I love how that looks. And there is some really great, there's just some really great imagery on show here when the little leaf is falling and they kind of clash feet and they break away and the leaf has been cut in half. That sort of thing is really cool to me. I just love this fight. I think it's really, really well done. Again, it feels emotional because there's personal stakes on the line here. I love Soifon casting off her captain's Hayori. Obviously, on the surface, it's done so that she can move around easier, but it feels like on a meta level, she's doing that because in this moment, she is finally casting off the authority of the Gotei 13 and making this fight personal, which it is to her. And I love that. I think that's so good. 
because most of the time she is insulting Yoroichi, saying, you know, you've lost your touch, you've 100 years in exile has made you rusty, I'm the new head of the Omnits Kiddo, they bow to me, and she, she places her Zanpakuto in the tree, summons all of these assassins, but watches as Yoroichi takes them all out. And really, this whole fight is a reality check for Soifon that a yeah, hundred years still doesn't put her on the same level as her former mentor. And it's just a brilliant, brilliant fight, ultimately culminating in Soifon thinking that she has invented this new technique called Shunko, a combination of Kido and Hakuda, but watching as Yoroichi reveals that she has known this technique for ages and is way more skilled with it than Soifon is. Ending with Yoroichi completely cancelling out her ability using Hanki Sosai, and Soifon just, you know, unable to understand how this woman is still outclassing her, but not just outclassing her, outclassing her with such ease. But despite that, there is a real sense of danger in this fight as well, with Soifon revealing Suzume Bachi, which is just such a cool Zanpakuto, stabbing Yoroichi, creating these homonka symbols all over her body, where if she hits her again, she'll be killed. And you know what? This is one of those fights where I'm always interested in like an alternate ending, where I'm always like, how would Soifon have actually reacted if she had actually killed Yoroichi here? And when you think about it from that perspective, it makes me wonder how hard she was actually trying, because it does seem like she was trying to kill her, and perhaps it was an impossible gap for her to breach, but it does feel like Soifon would be devastated if she actually killed Yoroichi in this fight. So that's always been really fascinating to me. And you get this crucial insight into Soifon's character, like I said at the start, where she was born and bred to be the arms and legs and eyes of Yoroichi Shihoin, basically, to serve her with her body, with her life, and to not have really any aspirations of her own, not have any dreams of her own, not have any wants of her own, to instead just be a, a vessel for the Shihoin noble family. And that's tragic, that is tragic, but it's a brutal reality of the kind of feudal system that the Soul Society operates on. It does make for a fascinating character. When Soifon discovers Yoroichi has left, she has gone, that betrayal is unfathomable, unbearable. And so, like I said, Soifon becomes who she is today, and it's only now where Yoroichi has seemingly bested her that the old Soifon returns, that Soifon comes back out of the darkness, essentially, and just starts crying. She sinks to the ground and she's like, why did you leave without me? Why didn't you take me with you? And so I, I've always loved this character turn because it means that Soifon, like I said earlier, there is more to her than just this statuesque follower of the rules. At the end of the day, when it came to Yoroichi, Soifon didn't care that she abandoned the Soul Society. She didn't care that she broke the rules, that she left her seat at the head of the Shihoin family. Which, for someone who is as stringent as Soifon, you think that is what matters to her, but it's not. It's the fact that she didn't take her with her. Soifon would have happily thrown everything out the window for Yoroichi, for this person who helped her see a life beyond that which was given to her that she was forced to walk. It's a really it's a really cool character dynamic because it, it's not on Yoroichi to have to take Soifon with her. But because Yoroichi leaves her there, it's like she's dooming Soifon to that life that she thought she was escaping. You know, it's like it's on Yoroichi that she has doomed Soifon to an eternity now of just having to be this remorseless, ruthless killer. I think that's really cool, and, and again, this is obviously why Soifon hates Kisuke Urahara as well, because he thinks that he is the reason Yoroichi had to leave. And I just love that. I think it's I think it's awesome. I think it's so cool. And for me, that is the apex of their relationship, boiled down in this moment. This moment of, you know, pure vulnerability for one of Bleach's coldest characters up until now. But these two characters are able to reconcile their differences and begin to mend their broken bridges just in time to hear that Aizen is a traitor to Soul Society and both Yoroichi and Soifon try and apprehend him personally. And that's a really cool moment of teamwork between the two as well, where Soifon appears behind Aizen and puts her blade to his throat while Yoroichi grabs hold of Aizen's hilt and stops him from being able to activate his Shikai. Really, really awesome, but of course he manages to escape anyway with Nikita. 
Yagathion. I like to think that in the moment after their battle, Yoroichi told Soifon everything that happened in Turn Back the Pendulum. So when it's revealed that Aizen is a traitor, maybe Soifon already knows. And I think that's really cool. That could be a really cool scenario as well. With the Iran car arc, Soifon has a little less to do, I would say, overall, but she still is quite heavily involved. Like many of the captains in the Gote 13, she doesn't arrive in the arc until the fake Karakura Town battle outside of one tiny captain's meeting early on. And she and Omaida step in to battle Barrigan's last remaining fraction, Geo Vega and Nurge Parduok. This is a decent fight. I like how Omaida really steps up to the plate in numerous occasions during this battle in the fake Karakura Town, and you actually start to see their relationship evolving. And I think some of this does come down to Soifon mellowing out a little bit, becoming a different person now that Yoroichi is back in the fold. But it is really cool seeing the second division get some serious spotlight here. Soifon is battling Geo Vega. It's a bit of a mirror match like many of the fights against the Arankar are. He's also kind of like the leith assassin of the Arankar in many ways. And Soifon seems to be getting defeated pretty badly here. There are some really cool moments like when Soifon manages to pin Geo Vega to a wall using Shitot Sansen and tries to finish him off with an assassination. But basically their whole fight is this discourse about what really makes for a true assassination. And this is the only time in the canon where we see Soifon actually kill somebody with Nigeki Kesatsu, which is really cool and satisfying to see. I absolutely love the visual design of that ability as well. The way Geo's body just erupts into the actual symbol of Suzuma Bachi itself. Um, I love how that looks. But then the two of them have to team up Soifon and Omaida to take on Espada number two, Barrigan Louisenbahn, who is a enemy that is totally out of their league, which I think is a really cool setup for a battle. Unlike a lot of the, like we mentioned earlier, Arankar and the Espada battles, which are mostly mirror matches in some way or another, this one is not. This one feels like it's totally, they are like total opposites in many ways. The only similarity they have really is that Soifon is the captain of Squad 2 and Barragan is Espada 2, but outside of that they couldn't be more mismatched. And you see how difficult that makes the fight for Soifon. She's basically unable to get anywhere near Barragon in his base form, which pretty much cancels out everything that Soifon can do, since she is essentially a very up-close and personal fighter, ideally sneaking around, coming out of nowhere and finishing someone off very quickly, but she cannot even get close because every time she does, time for her seems to slow to an absolute crawl, meaning Barragon has the total upper hand in this fight, Omaida wanting to lift the limit, but Soifon revealing they've already done so. It's a really good and dire moment, which only gets better once Barragon activates his Resurrection and uses Respirar to take Soifon's arm. This is one of the best scenes in the fake Karakura Town, and in my opinion, as I think I mentioned a long time ago in my battle analysis of this fight, was the peak of this battle, pretty much. Um, it feels so dire, it feels so dangerous. Soifon's arm rots down to bone and she can't believe what she's seeing. She's screaming... But I also do really like this moment for the characterization of her and Omaida. Soifon, despite the very bad situation she's finding herself in, is able to kind of collect herself a bit. Although she is screaming at Omaida, she knows exactly what needs to be done. And she's like, cut my arm off, you know, cut my arm off or I'm going to die without hesitation. And Omaida to his credit, also steps up to the plate here. And although he clearly doesn't want to, he cleaves Soifon's arm off and saves her life. And it's just a crazy moment, absolutely crazy, that really pushes the second division up against the wall in a way we've just never seen before. And Omaida and Soifon, although they'll never be close, this is really the start of a... of the building blocks of a closer relationship, perhaps a relationship where they can maybe rely on each other a little bit more than they were doing before. Because Soifom, because of the way she has been brought up and the way she has been told and taught to fight, is very unappreciative of what Omaida is at least trying to do. Omaida is a fool, he's a, an idiot, he doesn't really know how to fight a lot of the time it seems, but at the same time, his heart is in the right place and he definitely does respect his captain. He wants her to be able to rely on him. You know, he jumps in to protect her from Geo Vega at almost the cost of his own life and Soifon scolds him for it. And 
tells him, this is when she says to him, you know, even if your ally is in danger, if they're going to die, you should leave them to die if it means you can get, if you can score a critical hit on your enemy. That's what it means to be a member of the Omnitz Kido. And so it, it's... It's a really intriguing relationship and one that I think Kubo does quite well as they slowly build to this point where Soifon feels she can rely on him a little more. And as the fight progresses, we see that she leaves Omida to be a decoy for Barragan, kind of just putting him directly in harm's way rather than actually working with him, although the circumstances are different between here and Thousand Year Blood War. But as Omida is the decoy for her, she wraps herself around this building with her Jinjo Town, which is essentially a steel sash, and activates her Bankai Jakaho Raiko Ben, blasting Barragan with it and going flying. You know, the Jinjo Town actually ends up ripping due to the force of her Bankai, but Omida catches her and stops her from going too far and he congratulates her but she's like get your hands off me that's disgusting and this is this is in my opinion the moment that is really what you look back on in the thousand year blood war and see just how much they've changed Barragon is revealed to have survived, however, and Soifont and Omida end up teaming up with the Vizard Hatch again. And this is, like I said earlier, one of the things that did really annoy me about Soifont was you just kind of have to look at the context of a situation to realise how unreasonable and weird she's being. Like, I get that she hates the Vizard, that she's very prejudiced towards them. She might be prejudiced towards them for more reasons than just them seemingly being connected to Yodoichi disappearing. Probably there's something to do with the fact that they have hollow powers. I imagine she probably doesn't like that very much either. Um, but eventually they finally come to an agreement where she's like, seal Kisuke Urahara in one of your barriers for a month and I'll actually work with you. Despite the fact that their lives are totally on the line here. But they finally come to that agreement and they manage to trap Barragon and Soifon blasts him. Like I said, he re-emerges very, very wounded, but at this point, Hachi manages to finish him off. Soifon then teams up with the rest of the remaining Shinigami and Vizard to help protect Ichigo from Aizen, fighting him using a massive barrage of clones, which is really funny in my opinion because it totally makes Zomari's Hemolos Sonido look pretty worthless in comparison. Just, what, about 80 chapters ago, Zomari was summoning up to five clones and it was like this big deal, and now Soifon's just got like... 20 or something like that but I think it makes a lot of sense for a character who is as experienced and skillful as she is but she rushes in to attack Aizen as part of the captain's coordinated assault and she manages to stab Aizen in the chest once pull her blade back activate Nigeki Kesatsu and stab him again but this is a moment this is a really weird moment in general because it's hard to know if it's Aizen or Hinamori yet because Aizen apparently crushes her power with his own Reiatsu but if it was Hinomori, then Soifon just successfully stabbed her twice and therefore would have killed her. Um, but maybe there's no one there yet. Maybe it's literally nothing that Soifon is fighting and, and Aizen is currently swapping Hinomori and himself. It's hard to say, really, but it's still a cool moment. And I do like that Soifon tries to kill Aizen with Nigeki Kesat. So I think that's, that is a really nice moment. But then after Hitsugaya causes them all to be distracted, they're all taken out. When we get to the Lost Agent arc, we see Soifon greeting Ichigo when he arrives in the Gote 13. He speaks to her without an honorific, and she basically reprimands him, scolding him for being useless without Yodoichi being around. And this is really the first example of the canon manga mentioning her relationship again with Yodoichi since the Soul Society arc in a way that makes it look like she's still obsessed with her, or that she still holds her in incredibly high regard, whereas the anime had been doing loads with it up until this point. But although Soifon might be mellowing out, there is still that side of her that's very much focused on law and order, as she can't believe on a very superficial level that, that Ichigo would want to honour Ginjo with a proper burial because he was a murderous criminal who stole Shinigami powers, but then Shinji steps in and provides the more human um, antithesis to Soifon's argument, which is that he doesn't care about any of that stuff. He knows that Ichigo's not bothered about that. What, Ichigo's, what Ichigo should be bothered about is the fact that Ginjo messed with his friends and family. We then get to the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and this is a really weird one for Soifon, in that it starts out pretty good for this character, I would say. She does at least something throughout most of the arc. She is around for most of the arc, and then when they get to Varvel at the very end, she inexplicably totally disappears, like completely vanishes. So I want to just, when we get to that point, give a brief rundown of how I would change that scenario to keep Soifon involved. 
But at the start of the arc, she's present in the initial captain's meeting, and then in the first Quincy invasion, the second division comes under attack by Sternritter K, the robotic BG-9. And Soifon thinks that it'll be all right as long as they can finish them off immediately, to which point she activates her Bankai, but BG-9 steals it. Later, we get a nice character moment for Soifon, which again paints her as being this really ill-tempered, immature brat, almost, in terms of the captaincy, in that they are all mourning the deceased Yamamoto. And of course, this is really emotionally hard on everybody there, so it's not hard to see why she reacts in such a manner. But the Raite time member arrives only doing his job, you know, saying, you know, Byaki Akuchiki and Kenpachi Zaraki have both survived, but they are in critical condition. And Soifon, you know, absolutely just shouts at him, says, you know, we don't need to hear this right now. Why would you think you, we want to hear this right now? Kensei then, I think, rightly reprimands her, saying, you know, you're embarrassing yourself, calm down. To which point Soifon says, calm down, I'm embarrassing myself, the only reason you're so calm is because you didn't even like Yamamoto after what happened between the two of you, and Kensei is like, you know, what did you just say to me? Which I think is absolutely fair enough, Soifan again just totally acting way above her station and completely out of bounds here, eventually resulting in Komamura stepping in and having a massive go at her, shouting at her at the top of his voice and kind of like scaring her a bit, I think. And then again, she does displays this pattern of behaviour again when the Zero Division show up and, you know, the captains are all kind of trying to have a conversation with each other and Soifan suddenly just yells at them, being like, am I the only one who sees how crazy this is? You guys just sit up there in the palace watching us get beaten down by the Quincy and then you come down here and tell us that we did a bad job. Where were you? And it's a little bit awkward. It, it, it's supposed to feel awkward because like Shinji and Nukitake are like, okay. And then it, Ichibei just totally ignores her as well, which is really embarrassing. Like he turns around, he's like, anyway, so I was saying, at which point Soifon is like, Oi, I'm talking to you, and Tenjiro puts her in her place, appearing right behind her and restraining her with just two fingers, and he says, you know, pipe down, you know, who do you think you are? You're the Gote 13, you know what that means, right? It means it's your job to protect the Seireite, it's our job to protect the Royal Palace. If you guys failed, don't come crying to us. It's a harsh lesson, but there's no denying he's right on the money. And this is what I mean by it felt like Kubo really wanted to play up the immaturity of Soifon in this final arc and really make her the brunt, I think, of a lot of harsh lessons. Um, which I think is interesting. I think they need that within the captaincy. They can't all be cool, calm and composed all the time. And Soifon feels, I think, very human with her responses here. But it also did kind of annoy me a little bit because I was kind of like... You know, why are you talking to the Zero Division like that? <laughs> Although at the same time, she's asking valid questions, I think. So um, I kind of appreciate that in a way, because that insubordination is not how Soifon would have acted in the Soul Society arc. It feels like rather than rolling over, she's demanding answers. And I kind of appreciate that. In preparation for the next invasion, Soifon is seen training alone atop a mountain. And then when the second invasion begins, she arrives slightly late to the battle and saves Omida from BG-9. Soifon and BG-9's fight is not that long, I would say maybe combined about three chapters, but it's actually pretty good. And it's a shame that the fight ends with a somewhat inconclusive finale. Because I actually do like the choreography on show here. Soifon uses her completed Shunko to send BG-9 flying, then he tries to attack her by impaling her with one of his tendrils. She leaps over it backwards, grabs it, pulls him out of the rubble. Really nice stuff but he very quickly gets the upper hand on her, basically blasting her with missiles, then stabbing her through the wrist in an attempt to basically stop her from using Shunko again, which I think really kind of uh, reinforces the idea that he was the no or the knowledge or something like that, because just by coming up against Mukyu Shunko, he's learnt how best to counter it, and he says that he's gained valuable data, at which point he just detonates point-blank range into Soifon's face, pretty much, and she is, at this point, rendered totally unconscious. And Soifon looks in a really bad way here. Her body is charred, she's lying on the ground. BG-9 is, like, experimenting on her. Really weird and creepy, but he's, like, trying to get data from her body before she passes away. And this is where we get the culmination of her character development with Omaida. Their relationship comes to its ultimate point here, where she really can rely on him. Omaida, no longer being particularly cowardly, appears right in front of BG-9, grabs Soifron away from him and takes her away. And then he gives her the, the kind of holification pill 
that Kisuke was providing, and Soifon's like, you know, how could I not wake up to that annoying fool's voice? At which point she activates Bankai, having taken it back from BG-9, and BG-9's body begins to fail because he's being affected by Hollow Reatsu. But the key point here is that Soifon allows Omaida to hold her in place when she fires her Bankai. She's like, you know, hold still, Omaida, you know, hold still, I, you know, I need you to have my back. And he's like, yes, sir. And it's like a really nice moment where the two of them are fighting side by side. You know, compare and contrast that to the Iran car arc where he grabbed her after she used Bankai and she was like, get your hands off me, that's disgusting. Here she is like, I need you to hold me still, don't let me down. And that's a really, just a really great development. And of course he doesn't let her down, he does hold firm and her Bankai scores a great hit on BG9. After this, we can assume that using her Bankai effectively on Death's Door was enough to knock her out again, as Omida is carrying her unconscious body through waves of Soldat, showing again how much he's grown, until eventually she is healed at the Shinigami Stronghold, and they all prepare to assault the Royal Palace. A few characters do mention how much she seems to have changed, how much she's mellowed. Rukia mentions that to Renji at one point, and even Shinji kind of jabs Soifon almost playfully, and she says that she's going to kill him for that, but, it, you know, it's not real animosity. Soifon definitely has changed a little bit. She even meets Yoroichi's younger brother, Yushiro Shihoin, here, where she kind of fawns over him and wants to give him pocket money. Again, another reference, the most overt reference, I would say, to the changes made by the anime and the supplementary material, to the point where Soifon is totally infatuated with Yoroichi. The same now applies for her younger brother as well. However, she's very, very angry with Kyoraku for freeing Aizen, despite the benefits it obviously has to their pretty dire situation, but she calls him shameless for doing so. Then, however, they kind of put that aside when Aizen saves them from the Soul King's Ryatsu. Soifon activates Bankai to try and deal with it, but it totally overwhelms her. And then eventually they make their way up to the Royal Palace. They kind of discuss the situation a little bit together. And then Soifon vanishes. <laughs> she just basically totally disappears. And I presume what happens is Leal Barrow manages to snipe her, but that seems very unlikely to me. One of the smallest, most nimble, most evasive captains gets taken out by Leal? I don't think so. I think Kubo just plum forgot about her, which is a massive shame. And here's what I would have done if I was writing this. So I think this... This final battle in Varvelt presented us with an amazing opportunity to have Yoroichi and Soifon fighting side by side. I would not have brought Yushiro up to the battlefield because people don't care about Yushiro. He's a brand new character, and I, for one, wasn't particularly interested in getting him involved. I think it's enough for him to be there to give the the uh, instruments that he is carrying over to them to take up to the Royal Palace to use to get there. And then I think you just don't need him again. What I think you do instead is when Yoroichi is battling Askin Naklavar, it's Soifon who joins her from across the way rather than Yushiro, and they fight together. And I think it would have worked absolutely perfectly. You know, so you can totally imagine it. Soifon stabs Askin with, with her Shikai, and she stabs him again. But before she stabs him a second time, he's gained immunity to Nigeki Kesatsu, which allows him to defeat her. Or she uses her Bankai, but he's, again, gained immunity to her, Reiatsu. You would effectively have the exact same scene play out when Yushiro uses Bakuen Muso on Askin and he's basically bombed. The same thing would play out with Soifon's Bankai, where he would emerge from it unhurt in the end. Eventually, he would defeat Soifon, and the fight would carry on as it did. So for me, that's how I would have played it out. Soifon is therefore not forgotten about. She actually gets to be involved in a fight. She actually gets to fight alongside Yoroichi, and I think that just would have been a much better solution for this character. She's not totally forgotten about, however, as she does return 10 years later and is present at the inauguration of Rukia Kuchki as the 13th Division's new captain. And then in the Hell arc, she's seen briefly, she punches Omida to wake him up and get him to go to the ceremony in Karakura Town. And then later on, when the phosphoplasm of Hell is seen in the Soul Society, she tries to grab some, only for Kyoraku to kind of knock her away and explain what it is. 
And that's pretty much everything about the character of Soifon. I really hope you enjoyed this video. It actually went a little bit longer than I thought it was going to, but I had quite a bit to say regarding her relationship with Yoroichi and her relationship with Omaida as well, which I think Kubo takes to some really good places. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the character of Soifon. What do you think of my alternate ending for her character in the Thousand Year Blood War arc? And let me know what your favourite Soifon moment is. I'd love to know. But until next time, guys, don't forget to hit subscribe, and I'll catch you later. I'll see you then.